First of all, producer Jonas Rivera. Thank you. Thank you. And writer director Pete Doctor. Speech. And Joy Incarnate, Amy Furlow. So before I, before I throw it open to everybody, welcome Thank and, you. Thank you. and congratulations. Um, this is a very particular moment that you've taken in. It's pre-adolescence, it's pre all those teen dramas that we've seen so much of. And it's a particular moment and it's a very unusual location in the mind. So, you know, what's the, the reasoning? Because you're appealing to both adults and children. How can you make that balance? Mm, uh, <laughs> Let's see, big tro big topic. I think we, we went for this particular period in time in terms of uh, her being 11, because it's sort of like just on the cusp of a very important change, you know, something that uh, I observed in my own daughter uh, growing up and definitely remember from my own childhood. Um, but there's that period of childhood that everything is possible. Uh, there's still a kind of a bubble around you, that an innocence uh, that I think in a way we've spent our entire careers trying to get back to that. <laughs> And um, so talking about that, the loss of that um, felt very important. Well, also, tell the, the, what we found in the research, that 11 to, what oh, was yeah. that, 11 to 14. 11 to 17, I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, they said of all creatures uh, of humankind, the, mo the ones that are the most fully aware and in tune uh, emotionally are 11 to 17-year-old girls. Um, so they're just completely clued in and and. Uh, I would aware. have thought it was eighty to eighty-two year old men. <laughs> <laughs> men, I, and yeah, that's what you taught that. me and up. <laughs> <laughs> old men. <laughs> um, so just before I, I, I want to talk to Amy about um, how she, you know, positioning joy and the whole sort of tone of joy and joy's position uh, within the emotions. But uh, you obviously you mentioned research. You talked to neuroscientists. You mm -hmm. talked to I mean the again finding the balance between all that stuff you could put on there and at the same time making it visually engaging. How hard was that? Very difficult. Mm. Uh, we we knew it's not a science film. It doesn't purport to be accurate in any scientific way. But uh, it's such an abstract concept that we needed all the help we could get. So we turned to uh, science, we turned to ourselves, uh, the women on the show, we, we'd, we'd put them together and talk and just throw out questions like, what were your traumatic childhood experiences, you know, <laughs> let them go. And, and we try to work all that in, a, in an authentic way into the film. So, um, but I think the research was really important. It is on every one of the projects we've worked on, this one especially, just a lot of our own mind happens without us being aware of it. And, and that was the big revelation for me, is how much happens that we're not conscious of? How much is going on down there that is just bubbling below the surface that we don't even think about? And this film starts to tap into that a little bit. Because they reckon only, we only use about, we only know about 20% of what we do in the brain anyway, don't we? So there's a whole lot more. More films. <laughs> Amy, Amy, this fabulous performance as Joy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, she's amazing because she's almost like um, an extraordinary version of all those perky heroines who we've seen in animations before. Yes. She has that, that feeling of like, come with me kind of feeling. But she's also kind of looks like Peter Pan mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and an anime character and, yeah. and uh, Tinkerbell and... Jungle Book, and you know she's just um, but yes, she is the the engine, the energetic engine for sure. And but she just teeters on the edge of mania occasionally. Yes, <laughs> yes, um, unlike me. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, we 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 had to uh, work. Pete and Jonas and I worked to make sure to modulate her because she has to go through a journey, and so she does kind of bust out of the gate, really. Um, ready to go and by the end of the film she's she's slowed down she's gotten quiet she's learned how to live in the present moment she's had feelings a range of feelings and emotions and that was the most exciting thing about playing her is that she wasn't this one-dimensional character even though she was an emotion she had emotions and you got to see them in the film which is really awesome to play as an actor 
And how does it work in terms of, of script um, when you have an animation like this and you have an um, actor, writer like Amy, who's obviously going to contribute something as well, but presumably it's a kind of symbiotic process? Yeah, that was fun. We, we, had, <laughs> we had the whole kind of plot worked out, but then we said, okay, before we record, let's just <clears throat> go through this. And Amy and, and we sat in a hotel room and just read through it scene by scene, and we'd punch up stuff. He had a bunch of suggestions and things that we worked into the script before we were recorded. But then Amy's also so in, amazingly quick-witted that anything we'd put in front of you, you'd, you'd do what was written, but then you'd start going a bunch of different directions too. And, and then the tough job was like, okay, which of these 18 funny lines do we put in the movie? But you came, there was a lot of just great ideas that you would throw out that, I remember you even saying, well, this, this is a dumb idea, but what if she was playing an accordion? We're like, that's great. <laughs> we can animate to that. Yeah, just that little is... things to make her feel real to us. Uh, and I'll, let me handle the animation part. Then it goes into um, <laughs> like a, a weird chamber, and um, <laughs> lights are put on it, and it's sent to the lab, and then it goes through a coloring machine, and uh, then I think uh, people take a picture of that and run fast, and that's recorded, <laughs> and the film is made. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, time to throw it out now. To the, um, the first question is going to go to Caelan from Interfilm. I'm Caelan from Interfilm. I'm 16 years old, and I want to ask you two questions. Amy, how much is joy a genetic concept, and what points, what parts are your influence and in personality? And uh, I also wanted to ask for everyone, what are the two advantages of having a 11-year-old female protagonist and not a 17-year-old boy? Mm. Oh, such good questions mm -hmm. for a 16-year-old. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> the 25. Um, well, I'll just answer that first part and uh, pass it on. But uh, I, I, you're right. Joy is kind of almost an abstract concept that's hard to quite grasp. There's so many levels of it. And, and like was mentioned before, it can be manic or it can be fully present and alive. So it was playing all the shades of her because happy is is a really um, vague term. <laughs> Happiness and the pursuit of it. And what I love about the film is it, it reminds us that it's okay to not be happy all the time. No one is. And in fact, the pursuit of being happy all the time often gets in the way of change, growth, and like the next best thing. And then as far as well, the female foyer. protagonist? Well, we t I mean, I guess... I guess, yeah, Riley is actually Riley's not the protagonist, right? Joy is the protagonist, but Riley really is, is the vehicle and the, and the setting. But we thought about, I guess we thought about it. It could, it could have been a boy or a girl. I, I mean, really, you came to the table with an observation of your daughter. And uh, we're both parents, and our first kids are both girls. And we're pro it's probably just because we're overprotective fathers of girls that that felt like <laughs> the right um, first step. That's where we started. And then echoed in the in the research when when we heard yeah. that fact about just being um, uh, so observant at that age so it just felt like that was the right story to tell you should meet his daughter too she's very cute she's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, she's 16 she's, she's nine, also Amy. 16 <laughs> <laughs> just saying a man who knows what he wants <laughs> asks for it it's interesting okay yeah Hi there. Um, I have a, um, a question from my, my kids who are Hag and Con, um, one's eight and one's ten. Um, they would like to know, all three of you, um, what emotion did you feel most when you were kids and what emotion do you feel most now as adults? Ah, good question. Yeah. Mm. I didn't come up with that question. <laughs> I, I, I'd never come up with anything that clever. <laughs> I think my memory is having a lot of joy as a kid. Um, again, because you're sort of in the sort of bubble of like anything, you can do anything and run around, and then the world is, you know, up to you. Um, I think now it's mostly joy too. More fear than I'd like to admit, but <laughs> like right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say something stupid. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay, yeah. over there. Do you want to pass that oh. one? It's a question for uh, all three of you, really. It's regarding the uh, the voice casting in the film. There's a large contingent of sort of NBC uh, sitcom performers, really, in the yourself, Amy included. I'm just wondering if that's a conscious uh, decision and or if you just got Amy and then decided, let's go with the NBC sort of aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually so we started with Lewis Black. He was the one that kind of appeared, like I would use him as part of the pitch 
You know, imagine the fun we can have with the casting when you have people like Louis Black as Anger, for example. Um, and then, yeah, as it turned out, we realized he was probably the only one without a, a, an SNL slash um, uh, Lauren Michaels kind of mm -hmm. root in some way. Yeah. But that was kind of by just looking for actors with the skills and, and uh, elements that we were looking for. Yeah, I was the last to join. So um, it was, um, it was, I think, just good casting and that was kind of happenstance the rest of it but mm -hmm. I mean I can't imagine anyone else doing the voices now after the performances in that film Dang. but NBC does get 10% of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay where's that left? 10% um, qu <laughs> question for Amy yes sir um, third row oh, yeah. um, I wondered if you with the protagonist being a girl did you relate to the film uh, as a remembering you as a child, or do you, do you think of your two sons mm. now? Uh, and also, when you were asked for your traumatic childhood experiences, um, what did you come up with and did any make the film? Uh, let me tell you, I'll tell you all about my traumatic, uh, no. Um, uh, I think what's so great about the film is you relate to it as a human uh, adult when you watch it and you think about what, what used to bring me joy that doesn't anymore, what have I forgotten, uh, what are my islands of personality, uh, you relate to it as a parent, certainly, which is how do I, uh, you know, help my child avoid pain while not depriving them of real experience. And then, yes, definitely as a woman, you think about when you were 11, which, as Pete says, is like this magic hour where you, where puberty hasn't ruined everything yet. <laughs> and you really do have the whole world in front of you, hopefully. Um, so you, I, I thought of all those things all the time when I was watching it, and, and every time I watch it, I think of a different thing. Um, yeah. Hi, Kristen for uh, Amy. Um, you've been over in the UK on the promo tour for this quite a lot, and also obviously filming with Parks and Rec. So is there um, a particular UK celebrity or element mm. or pop culture which uh, particularly fascinates you? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Well, you know what? What I do, I, this is going to be a, a kind of a, an annoying non-answer, but but what I love is growing up in 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 uh, the states in the '90s, like British comedy, we could only pass around like it was a secret. You know, we had tapes of v VHS tapes of the day today, and Steve Coogan, and you would tell someone like, "Have you seen The Brass Eye?" You know, and they'd be like, no, and you'd be like, it's a pretty cool show in England, and like, I'm the only one that knows about it. Um, and there was this mystery about uh, British comedy because we couldn't get it. And that's been, that's changed, I'm sure, for the better. But there used to be this found wonderful feeling of discovering the comedians over here and feeling a, 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 like you were the only one who knew them. Um, so I have such nostalgia for the, like, kind of 90s comedy people that I watched in my you know, apartment when I was in college and stuff. But, um, yeah, so those, those, all those people. <laughs> Another question for Amy. As sort of getting inside the mind of a child, has that made you understand your boys a little more and maybe be less exasperated <laughs> sometimes? Yeah, I, I think so. I think I, they, it's really interesting to, ha to, you know, we all have kids and to, to watch them figure out how they feel is is complicated because they just don't often know how to express it. And what I love about the film is it gives children tools, ways to talk about how they're feeling that isn't the direct, how are you feeling? Um, and my boys certainly do that. They talk about anger as if he's a funny character. And then by doing so, we can then say, isn't it funny when you get angry how you don't listen? <laughs> and they go, what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but <laughs> I've tried that, and then they go, they go, wait a minute, what are you trying to do yeah. to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> General question for the panel, if I may. What is your definition of joy mm -hmm. without the capital J? I'll tell you, I, I don't, there's, it's, it's, there's so much. I mean, honestly, I feel like we have the greatest jobs in the world. Uh, I never dreamed I'd be here in front of in front of you in this great city with the film that we spent five years of our life on that we are so proud of and that that's a love letter to our kids. So I mean, it's obviously our families uh, that that to me brings the greatest joy. But I also happen to have the, the, this job that I I could not feel luckier to have. You know, work with people like Amy and 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 my best friends on making things. We get to make things and you know put them out into the world and and with enough time and care from the studio that 
we can hope, hopefully can craft them into being meaningful. And so I guess my family and my job. And that's Fair. not easy. Is that correct? <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> Good job. At this point, you, you know each other well enough. Yeah. <laughs> that's not easy. Sometimes you fight with each other. Sometimes you walk home completely defeated and depressed. But I think that's, in part, the answer to the question is joy is uh, a deeper, wider range of emotional experience than just like, we, we, ran, we rode a roller coaster. It's, right. it's uh, you know, it's uh, defeat and sadness and uh, despair and all those things the complete range of emotions, which is what we're kind of trying to get to in the film. Yeah, did you ever count the number of emotions you had while making the film? Mm. <laughs> it's good. Endless. And just for the whole uh, panel, I was just wondering if you had any imaginary friends and if you remember oh. them. Uh -huh. <laughs> I did not. I wish I did. I know Pete did. Yeah, Pete did. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. I had um, a small elephant. It was not pink, but he drove a, a magnetic car so he could drive on the wall and the ceiling. <laughs> that way, if I was bored, I could just watch him drive around. His name was Norman. I don't, <laughs> don't know why. And he had nothing to do with Bing Bong. It's completely no. separate. I, don't know. I do have an imaginary enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's here. <laughs> and he's hoping that I don't do well. <laughs> <laughs> he knows who he is. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask how your experience was at Cannes. And did you expect the film to resonate with people and be so loved by everyone as it is? I don't know. Do we expect that? No, no we, we were so we were so blown away to, to be there and uh, it's such an honor to be asked to go there. Honestly, it's probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life. Mm -hmm. They can, as you know, is a very discerning audience and they they, <laughs> they spend a lot of time warning us. Yeah. They said, now remember, you know, this, I guess just to manage our expectations, which is nice, but they, they'd say, you remember, they, they, they'll they boo, you know, if they don't like you and <laughs> they, they don't necessarily love big American movies and we're like, well, <laughs> why are we showing it again? <laughs> they, you know, booed a couple of films before us and yeah. but go in and have fun yeah. <laughs> there we go and so we you know we sat there you know, yeah. pretty pretty quiet and uh it was even during the screening it was a little i maybe because everybody's in their tuxedos mm -hmm. they don't yeah. like whoop it up and it's pretty quiet yeah now. but boy i'll tell you that it was it was overwhelming when the lights came on and they run cameras up to you you know and yeah. you guys and and people really uh applauded it and welcomed it and it was one of the one of the great thrills that we've ever had and kind of walked out of there in a daze, to be honest. Yeah, yeah it was really totally it. surreal. It was amazing. I mean, there's nowhere to go but down after that. I mean, it was like a 20-minute standing ovation these guys got. I mean, can is ruined for me. <laughs> <laughs> Never go back again. Yeah. Go back. <laughs> it was very special. It was amazing. Hi, sorry, another question for Amy. Oh. <laughs> I um, I loved your book, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And you seem to really focus on obviously being honest, but also quite positive and joyful in your book. Could you have played any of the other characters, or do you feel like Joy was just a good fit for you? Um, I was so happy to play Joy, and I felt when I was asked, I said, I think I can do this. I, I see how I could do this. But um, and again, I don't, I couldn't picture any of the other characters being done by anyone other than the actress who did them. However, I think I could do anger, mm -hmm. but it would be a, my own version of it. But that was the one the, mm -hmm. of, of all the emotions. And I, I think I could, uh, you know, uh, wrestle that up if I, if I needed to. <laughs> and, but, I mean, Lewis is so funny, and it's my kid's favorite emotion, anger. They just love how he misbehaves. And he's just <laughs> such a... S like a comedy character. So the comedy of anger, I really enjoy. Anger gets a lot of good jokes. <laughs> yeah. I've got a question for Pete. Uh, congratulations on the film. It's fantastic. I was wondering uh, what emotions nearly made the cut that were not in the top five? And also, were you tempted to perhaps give Riley's parents more emotions because they're adults? Mm. Or, or would that have been too inconsistent with, the, the obviously, the gags that ran through? No, we did. We had a version of the film that started just with joy, obviously, as we have in the final. Um, and then we added to them. And so then I think we were jumping forwards in time, and there was a big bunch of, like, 27 characters in Riley's head, including... Uh, Pride, and we actually ran with this one for quite a while. Pride was had his nose turned up, and you know thought Riley should 
be the president of the United States. And they're like, but she's 11. She's not eligible. Well, she's good enough, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and then we had, we had uh, Hope. Hope was always running around going, ooh, I hope there's this and that. And so that's why we cut her. Um, <laughs> um, we had Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. Who, uh, yeah. He wore later hosen, and yeah. you know when people would fall down, he would say, <laughs> your cries of pain amuse me. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we had Ennui, who was kind of like, hey, you, you want to come over here and help? And he's like, eh. You know, that's, he never spoke. Yeah. <laughs> So we, we, we experimented with a bunch of stuff. Um, in the end, we, f we felt like, okay, we want to be able to know who everybody is and keep track of them. So anybody who's kind of superfluous or not, especially who doesn't, who steps on Joy's stuff, you know, that's why we got rid of Pride and Hope, because they were starting to work in some of the t same turf that we needed Joy to be. So that's uh, why we cut them out. But you can see them all in Pete's one-man show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the Bay Area. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. Congratulations on the film. Um, my question is to Pete. Obviously, with this film, you're literally uh, playing with emotions, but that's something that you're very familiar <coughs> with uh, with the Toy Story franchise. I'm curious, having had the opportunity to do something completely uh, new like this, how do you feel to be continuing that story, and are there particular emotions that you feel um, you've still got left to explore there? Yeah, I mean, I think emotions are like what you're always playing with as uh, storytellers and entertainers, right? If you come up here and give a bunch of bland facts, people fall asleep. But uh, if you uh, engage them emotionally, and that's where, like, even when our kids were little, I don't know if your kids, you had the same experience. If you're, let's say, you're uh, having an argument, the kids have no idea it's over the tax refund, but they know that mom and dad are upset. So it's like the original language before they even speak English or whatever language they speak, they understand emotion. So it's a very primary thing, um, which is, you know, of course, what we're after uh, in all the films. So this one, this one was had a lot of rich stuff. It had multiple layers of entertainment, um, uh, familiarity, and a chance to bring people somewhere new. And then also, you know, as we got into it, some really deep stuff. Um, so it was, it was ours to lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi there. Um, in um, with Up, I kind of feel like I hadn't sort of cried in a, ci in a cinema and on repeat viewings uh, oh. so many times cool. uh, with the film. Um, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is this? I'm so happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and you, you repeated it with, uh, with Inside Out. Um, and, uh, and I'm wondering, like, how do you, as filmmakers, how do you move an audience so much? I mean, what's the, you know, what's the secret? <laughs> mm. I don't know that there's a secret other than we have great people. Our, our editor, Kevin Nolting, is a big contributor to all this. Just yeah. the pacing and the sense of, uh, he's just got a really intuitive sense for things, both comedy and for the drama and, and uh, uh, you know, sadness. So he was great. Uh, Ronnie Del Carmen, who's our co-director, who's not here today, really contributed heavily to, to Up. He boarded that little sequence that you were talking about. Um, and he's a sort of secret weapon for us as well. You know, as, as you rattle off the names, just to echo that, I think one of the secrets is everybody at Pixar, and even everybody um, outside of you, like Michael Giacchino, you know, our composer, who did the score for both Up and Inside Out, everybody approaches their job as a filmmaker or a storyteller. So when we meet with uh, the director of photography of lighting, you know, Kim White, she doesn't really talk about the technical side as much right. of lighting a shot. She talks to people, how should this feel? What what is this sad? Is this happy? What's the emotional under, undertone of each single frame of the film? And Michael, when we sat down to talk score, we didn't talk about theory or orchestration or what we wanted. It was, what does this feel like? Well, this is for our kids, and let me, let me explore with some music on just feel. Everything's about feel. And I think somehow that aggregates out to just um, emotion somehow. It's everyone's approaching it from making a film as opposed to their individual craft. And I, I, don't, I don't know. I've only worked at Pixar, but I suspect that's pretty rare in the approach of, of every single person. And as you talk about it, I bet it's like basically two things. This is never a simple answer to a question like that. Uh, it's having something uh, to say, like having a real nugget of something, and then having really great people to execute it well. The real question is, why do you think you not cry enough? <laughs> 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 I think that's where we need to go next. <laughs> need yourself a good cry, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, um, I've got another question for Amy. Um, 
how does Inside Out relate to the work that you do with smart girls? And was it important for Joy to be a kind of complex character in order to offer more positive role models for young girls? Thank you for mentioning those two things in the same sentence. Uh, Smart Girls is a website that I do, and we deal a lot with that kind of spirit and energy of being inclusive and kind of uh, unembarrassed by your joy and uh, celebrating the ordinary curiosity of um, regular young people. Um, I think it 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 there is a there was a beautiful. Uh, feeling that those things were linked somehow for me and it, those feelings were easy to access. And I did really want Joy to be um, a, a fully realized character. I wanted her to feel like someone that you that you cared about and that you wanted to watch change. And the enthusiasm and exuberance that she has is very, is kind of like what you want and you hope for for young women. Just this unbridled energy and lack of self you know not she's not self-conscious you know and she's and she just doesn't she isn't concerned very much about what other people think of her which is super refreshing it, it that doesn't uh, suddenly change in your 40s like it's just this kind of constant struggle about who you are and what do you want to be and what do you want to say and so I loved her for that and I loved playing her because of that and I love girls that tap into that and women that try to get back to that and people, men and women that encourage that. So, yeah. That was, I don't know if we told you, but that was like what cemented us is like, we need Amy because we That's already how I knew, got the job. We already knew you could play it. But then <laughs> we saw you uh, talking, answering one of the questions just about, I don't remember, body image or something. And uh, the site, I hadn't seen the site, but it was, uh, that was like, you, you were talking the same language that we were. Oh, that's film, great. So it's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Hi. Um, obviously, all the emotions care about Riley, but it kind of seems like Joy is the one that's really connected with her and really knows her kind of purpose. Um, why kind of is that? And if there was a sequel, could there possibly be a person who has kind of a different emotion kind of leading the way? We were inspired by little kids who just seem happy all the time. That seems, uh, I know a number of them who are just like, given any situation, they're having a good time. And so it seemed like, okay, let's set joy as the dominant, you know, driver in there. Um, that's somebody that is going to be just appealing to watch. And and then all the more sort of tragic when adulthood happens. Uh, so that's that was the reason why. Um, in terms of sequels, we haven't really thought at all about sequels. I, I have. I have. Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> Pitch us later. I'll pitch you a couple ideas later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I guess the obvious question is if there are all those other emotions, you know, they could come mm -hmm. in too as mm -hmm. things get more complicated. Or we just stay with joy. I mean. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it seemed to work out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe only joy. <laughs> Just uh, joy. Oh joy goes to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and joy has a semester abroad. <laughs> Go ahead. Joy in space. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, this one's for Amy. Uh, uh, of course, you play one of five emotions uh, in a story that gives you that very clever uh, breakdown of uh, what's going on in our heads. Has doing the film made you think differently about your own mind and thought processes? Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, it's it's always a nice reminder that sadness can be your friend. You know that it's that it can help you, and that and so I think about that quite often when I'm feeling conflicted, like which emotions are running the show, and I think about them now in and in terms of how they look in the film, and um, disgust and fear probably were bigger, played a bigger part in my life when I was younger. They don't as much anymore. I look forward to them <laughs> coming back in my 60s. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so fear, uh, sadness, um, joy, and anger are kind of my, my top three. And, uh, but it's just, uh, it does, it just makes you think about what you're thinking. And it also reminds you that you never know what anybody's thinking or going through or feeling. And the way someone is acting isn't, often the way that they're feeling. And um, that's always a good reminder as a human person in the world. Mouse rat forever. OK. <laughs> <laughs> mouse rat t-shirt. Any more questions for you? Um, I've got one, if not, which is um, 
So all these neuroscientists and um, that you consulted beforehand, when they see the film, what do they say? We've gotten a lot of nice responses. I mean, uh, from you know Dr. Paul Ekman to Dr. Keltner, who's at Cal Berkeley, who helped us a lot, to the good folks at Columbia, you know, the Brain Institute there. We're, we, <laughs> we were happy to hear them reach back out to us and say how proud they were of it because our, our hope was that at the very least they wouldn't be in the audience rolling their eyes mm-hmm. at how you know, ridiculously off the rails we went. But I think they, they've let us know that we found a way to sort of honor the science of, of, of memories and emotions at the same time uh, painting a, a motion picture that's entertaining and fun. So that, that meant a lot to us. No yeah. one has said we're out of bounds. We had a screening for uh, Ekman and Keltner. And besides Cannes, that was the most nervous I've been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we showed it along the way, and I think Ekman called it uh, excruciatingly dull or something like that. Yeah, that, that was nice. <laughs> you, these are signs, they don't, they don't do a lot of laughing. So. No. <laughs> uh, but more than that, I was just worried that, you know, we played fast and loose with a lot of ideas in this yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, and it's not a science film, it's just a piece of entertainment. But, um, you know, we showed it to them and they both came out just sort of glowing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty awesome. Okay, well, just just final thought maybe for all three of you. They say that the Jurassic Park films spawned a whole generation of paleontologists, you know, mm-hmm. far more that the admissions to college to reach, uh, study paleontology went right up. Uh-huh. Neuroscientists, do you think there'll be a, a new wave of neuroscientists? That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be cool. That those. would be amazing. Or people who sell pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Broccoli pizza. Yeah, all are welcome. <laughs> pizza sellers. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much uh, for your questions and Amy, Pete, and Jonas. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.